Being in the Grand Prairie area, I always find especially thrilling. Although work has been going on in the Grand Prairie area for decades, it's always been somewhat intermittent. Um, so in a lot of ways, Grand Prairie remains a new frontier in Alberta paleontology. down to a place called Wapiti Gardens. It's a spot on the river that I've been to before and found a few things, but haven't found anything sort of substantial enough yet to bring like a big group of people out. But I'm fairly certain there's probably something worthwhile down there. Uh, it's just a matter of spending some time looking. Today, I've got my dad and my son with me. It's just kind of nice to bring everybody out on the river. And really, essentially what we're doing is just going for a walk. Walking along, seeing if you can spot anything interesting to pick up, to take back. Some days you find things. Some days you don't find anything at all. I'm a paleontologist and I live in Grand Prairie, Alberta. I've got to spend a lot of time out on the rivers and the creeks and really all around the Grand Prairie region. I've been lucky enough to find a lot while I've been searching up and down those rivers and creeks. Things like dinosaur bone beds, skeletons of dinosaurs, teeth, plants. It takes quite a bit of time and effort to actually find something worthwhile. So we're looking for stuff that's kind of shiny and dark brown. Grand Prairie is in this really interesting location where we have all kinds of fossils from a slightly different time period and a different geographic location than what we would typically find dinosaurs in Alberta. This is definitely something. This is probably a rib from something like a hadrosaur. I mean, it's hard to tell because there's still more of it that goes in the rock here. Some of it's been broken off and eroded out right there. But the overall shape of it looks generally like an end of a rib, getting close to sort of where the rib would attach to the backbone. So one of the things that I like so much about looking for dinosaurs in Grand Prairie is that it's so easy for me. One of the best spots that we have to find fossils that we've gone back to year after year and have pulled out dozens of different species from is within 20 minutes of my house. When I'm here, we just hop in the water, float down, and sometimes, as we're floating down the river, we stop and we find a complete dinosaur bone, complete in the sense of three feet long from end to end. And we can just pull it out, put plaster on it, throw it in the canoe, and take it with us. And it's that ease of access, that ability to get out almost whenever, that allows me so much more freedom and so much more time to be able to find things while I'm out here. So the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum is Northern Alberta's only dinosaur museum, and it's our job to study the dinosaurs in the region and raise awareness about the dinosaurs and the other fossil animals that were living in this area millions of years ago. I'm the assistant curator at the museum, so it's my responsibility to study the dinosaurs and be a resource for making displays and other outreach that we do here at the museum. So this is a, a cast of the southern species of Pachyrhinosaurus, but this is the actual dinosaur bone uh, of Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae that was collected just south of us here and is about 73 million years old. So this is the collection space at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, and it's where we store the bones that aren't actively being worked on in our preparation lab. So these are all fossils that we've collected in the uh, past uh, couple of seasons. This uh, dinosaur site, the Pipestone Creek Bone Bed, has been worked by different institutions since 1986. 
and we've been collecting from it recently. We've collected over 450 elements from the site in the last two years, and this is a fossil with all of the rock that's still stuck onto the surface. So the fossil is basically underneath in this plaster jacket, um, plaster and burlap, and it is a uh, protecting and holding the fossil together until it can be taken into our lab to be fully cleaned and prepared and made available for study. The rocks we have here belong to what's known as the Wapiti Formation, and we're particularly interested in Unit 3 of the Wapiti Formation, which dates to 73 or 74 million years ago. So that's the age of the dinosaurs we're finding. And that's an interesting time in the Cretaceous. It, it's what's known as the Late Campanian, so we're towards the end of the Cretaceous, but not at the very end. And at that time, sea levels were particularly high. The Grand Prairie area was farther from the ancient coastline and was essentially high and dry, so that here we have a continuous terrestrial record preserving dinosaurs and other land animals rather than marine reptiles. So the Grand Prairie area is a place that can tell us what was going on on land during that interval of time when sea levels were high and places like Dinosaur Provincial Park were effectively inundated. Okay, so this is the Spring Creek bone bed uh, near Spring Creek on the Wapiti River, just a little west of Grand Prairie. This site actually has an interesting history. It's been known for decades, and it was worked over a couple of field seasons by the Tyrrell Museum and Grand Prairie Regional College uh, around 1990. And they collected dozens of uh, really nice juvenile hadrosaur bones, um, disarticulated material, but uh, very well preserved. Uh, and then the site disappeared. And it disappeared because the uh, bank slumped down and it was covered in sediment. And it couldn't be relocated, despite multiple attempts, uh, until 2018, when um, Matt Vavrick uh, was out prospecting, uh, stopped by this site, and to his surprise and everyone else's, was able to actually relocate the bone layer. So we jumped in eagerly, um, started excavating, collected, I believe, over 100 bones uh, last year, and our job this time is simply to continue the excavation to try to expose and collect more bones. Let's measure everything out. Here in Grand Prairie, we're always working near rivers. Um, so this is quite a typical situation where we're excavating on a river bank from um, strata exposed along the river bed. And at this spot in particular, um, the river bank is quite steep, so it's prone to slumping. Uh, in other words, rock is prone to falling down into our quarry and potentially onto us. So one way we're minimizing that is to, as much as possible, work our way along the edge um, at a shallow depth rather than digging a long way back, because that would result in a high, deep back wall of the quarry, which would be prone to collapsing. Here at Spring Creek with me today are um, three members of the field crew, plus a volunteer who is just with us for today. What we're looking for at this site is material from juvenile hadrosaurs. So hadrosaurs are duck-billed dinosaurs, um, and they had uh, two main varieties, the crested ones and the non-crested ones. We think that it's maybe the crested ones that are here, but we still haven't found very many skull bones. Uh, hopefully we'll find some more this year, which will help us determine exactly what we've got in this area, but we're hoping to find just about any kind of bones from this animal. I'm a master's student from Australia, from the New University of New England, and I've come over to Grand Prairie to work specifically on this bone bed. Um, as it makes up the bulk of my thesis. So we're looking at the juveniles within the bone bed, and what led them to be preserved here and what implications that has for their evolution and their paleobiology. I'm from China. I'm a student of uh, Colin Sullivan. So what I'm doing at this particular square is to take down the matrix or the mud layer by layer uh, so that we can find some bone pieces like this rib fragment here. So I decided to come out and volunteer today because I've always been passionate about dinosaurs and we've got so many great fossil sites around Grand Prairie. It's one of the things I love most about living here. Uh, I've been volunteering with the museum um, cleaning fossils for a few years now and I'm really excited to actually get out and work in the field. 
When a fossil is first collected, it's typically covered in rock. It's often a bit damaged during the collecting process, despite our best efforts. So the work of someone called a preparator or a technician is to clean off the rock, repair any damage to the fossil, and essentially prepare it for research and display. Robin has been playing that role um, in our team. She assists us in the field, she assists us in the lab doing this work of preparation. Removing rock can be as easy as brushing it away with a small brush and some water, or as difficult as using pneumatic tools like air scribes to chip away very, very hard rock from the bone a little bit at a time. And the idea is to do as little damage as possible while revealing as much data as possible. You want to have these fossils be useful for scientists, useful for educators, but you don't want to compromise the fossil so that it would fall apart or, or break under its own weight or something like that. So this animal is a juvenile duckbill dinosaur, a juvenile hadrosaur. It's a fairly young animal, not full size, but still a lot of big bones, as you can see. We've got kind of bits and pieces of the skeleton a little bit jumbled up here. Part of the chest area with the ribs here is still articulated and you can see the shoulder blade over top, and there's actually even a little bit of skin impression on the end. Wow. And then other parts of the body have been pulled apart, disarticulated, so they're no longer in life position. They've been kind of sloshed around by the water, and we've got little bits and pieces kind of all over from, you know, a, a, a leg bone here. This is probably a fibula, one of the lower leg bones. Oh, yeah. Um, this is probably a tibia, so these two, you know, kind of go together. Go together, yeah. yeah. Then we've got a couple of hip bones. This is a pubis. Uh, there's the front part of it here that faces forward, and then this is actually part of the hip socket area, and then there's this projection that goes backwards as well. And here we have um, probably one of the metatarsals from the foot, so part of the, the sort of flat part of the foot here. And then we've also got uh, a big femur here from, from this end here. There's the head all the way down to the knee area, so half of it's actually underneath these ribs. So you think it is complete? Yeah, I think so, cool. yeah. We're working in Grand Prairie right now because it's an area that has traditionally been understudied. A lot of southern Alberta, other areas in Alberta, have been extensively looked at by many different paleontologists for fossils. Northern Alberta has had less of that for several reasons, one of them being it's less accessible up there. Many of the rock formations are harder to get to. However, there's plenty of fossils up there. So being able to work these formations and find fossils in this area, it's very exciting because a lot of it's breaking new ground. We're finding new things and uh, new data to add to our understanding of these animals. For my master's thesis, I am studying a dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, which is a type of horned dinosaur from Grand Prairie, Alberta. And I am studying their skeleton, so everything but the head. And I'm trying to do a general description of their skeleton as well as make some inferences as to their posture, how they walked. I'm also gonna look into their, what we call ontogeny, which is the way that they grew. How big did they exactly get? What was their body mass? How did their bones change as they grew? So lately I've been focusing on what we call the forelimb and the pectoral girdle. So that's the front legs and the shoulder. And I've been looking for different features that can actually help us distinguish between uh, different types of horned dinosaurs just by looking at the, at the forelimb and shoulder girdle. Because until this point, for us to actually identify a ceratopsian dinosaur, we need to be able to find the skull. So if you find a specimen that doesn't have a skull associated with it, you can't identify it other than it's a, it's a ceratopsian, but you can't say exactly what group it belongs to other than that. So with me actually describing the forelimb and uh, pectoral girdle, I can find different features in there that can actually help us in the future. So if a paleontologist goes and finds postcranial elements, they are able to identify it past just being a ceratopsian. I'm a graduate student at the University of Alberta studying vertebrate paleontology, and I work on functional morphology and biomechanical modeling of duck-billed dinosaurs. What I really like about biomechanical modeling is that it kind of brings the fossils back to life in a way. You can see them moving uh, and you can see their structure and how it works together, and I think that that's just very interesting. 
The work that I do works mostly with the fossils themselves, but I use a lot of uh, technology and softwares to help me out with it. So I do scan the bones to get 3D models of them, uh, and I articulate them in the computer so that I can get a functioning 3D model of a limb or whatever I'm working on. Sometimes when you go to museums, uh, they're in the galleries when they're mounted specimens. They're not necessarily in the right shape. Sometimes uh, they would have actually had to have broken their arms to do that kind of, of movement that they have them in. So uh, what my project is trying to do is putting a limit on that movement and trying to decide how, when they were alive, they would have actually been able to move and how powerfully they would have been able to do those movements. What I love about paleontology, and not even just dinosaurs, but paleontology in general, is that you get an appreciation for how old the Earth is and what has been here before we were even considered to exist on Earth. You can find fossils from hundreds of millions of years ago, and you can really see the progression of life through time. And when you stop and think about that and how long that took and how perfect the conditions had to be for every single piece to fall into place for us to be here or for dinosaurs to be here, it's just incomprehensible.